it's hard to escape the sentiment during this time of year that we should be happy and jolly. But what about anxious, sad, frantic, or even scared? For some, the holidays can be challenging, even without the backdrop of a pandemic. Heather O'Neill is a writer and novelist whose work has twice won the Hugh McLennan Prize for fiction. In her 2018 book, Wisdom and Nonsense, Invaluable Lessons from My Father, she reflected on dealing with difficult relationships, and she joins us now from Montreal for her perspective. Hi, Heather. It's so nice to meet you. Oh, it's wonderful to meet you, too. I know you hear this a lot, but your writing is phenomenal. It just stays with you. Um, so it's a pleasure to be able to talk to you about this. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, to start our conversation, I wanted to read an excerpt from your book, Wisdom and Nonsense. And you write, When I was five years old, my parents got divorced. My mother packed me up and put me in the back seat of our burgundy car. She tossed my dad's stuff out of the trunk, and we drove down to Virginia. After two and a half years of moving around, she told me she had changed her mind about wanting to be my mother. She put me on a plane and I showed up back in Montreal. I just want to go over that one sentence. She told me she had changed her mind about wanting to be my mother. That's mm -hmm. a sentence that just hits you right here. What was it like for you as a five-year-old to hear that from your own mom? Um, I was seven at the time and it was something that was also reiterated to me over the years. Um, it was it was just devastating because it made me feel that I didn't even deserve a mother and that she had this option to leave me if I if she wanted. And you know, essentially I was broken up with by my mother and it, it was kind of an abandonment feeling that I've never gotten over and it kind of haunts me. Do you remember that moment when you did part? I do. I remember, um, actually what I remember more was arriving in Montreal. I don't actually remember so much. I think I blocked that out, the saying goodbye. I just remember arriving in Montreal and then encountering my father, who I had no memory of at that time. And it was just this very um, burly, tough-looking guy with, you know, kind of crazy hair, and he just gave me this big hug, and I was like... Um, who is this mm -hmm. um, very like stranger? So it's you and your dad in Montreal. What was it? What was he like as a person, as a father? Um, I mean, he was a very colorful character. He was. Um, he had been a, when he, he was born in the late 1920s, and uh, when he was young, he kind of became involved in the Montreal underworld and was a criminal. And, you know, after the Second World War, he had decided to straighten up his act, but he always felt that that was a mistake and he had missed his calling because the only time he had kind of ever done well in the world when he, was when he was a criminal. So when I was a little girl, he would just, as bedtime stories, tell me all these very um, eccentric, over-the-top, uh, rose-colored portraits of the Montreal crime scene in the 30s and 40s, and they were sort of... Um, became, yeah, these little lullabies for me. And that really affected my writing, his ability to romanticize the most um, kind of dark um, areas and chapters in the world. It's, from reading the, um, your book, it seemed as if he wanted to instill in you um, that you could do anything and that you were larger than life. Oh, yeah. I mean, he was a fantasist, but he kind of brought me along with him. And I mean, we made an odd couple because he had uh, left school at grade three and he couldn't really read. And then he had this little girl with him who was uh, just I mean, I just loved reading books and would just disappear in them and was always writing. So um, then he had through me, he 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 kind of wanted to be into the intellectual world. So he would always um, come up with these stories and how I could be perceived as an intellectual in the world. So he would tell me to tell everyone he was a philosophy professor and that I was a child of, of philosophers. How would you, like looking back, because I think sometimes, um, I think as we get older, we look at our parents more as people instead of our parents who are infallible and belong to us. When you look back on your childhood, how would you describe your upbringing with him? Uh, 
very erratic. We would, um, there were moments that were quite wonderful and we would, um, go through the neighborhood and, you know, have our dinner on a bench and just watch street performers and talk about fun things. But there were other moments where he would just become very, um, violent and have these outbursts and, you know, and throughout my life, I would just like crawl out the fire escape and run away and stuff. So it was very um, back and forth. So there were these moments that were lovely and touching, which I still have and hold. And there are other moments that were quite brutal that I have, um, you know, difficult memories of. You know, um, I just wanted to go back a little bit on what you said, assuming uh, your mom knew him, knew who mm -hmm. he was, um, yeah. and yet she entrusted him to take care of a vulnerable um, child. Mm -hmm. as, an, as a grown-up now, are you able to square that? Like, how do you reconcile that? That she left you with somebody that puts you in dangerous situations? Um, I can't really reconcile it. It's, um, that's what makes it difficult for me. I'm not angry with her, but we can never have a relationship because I can never get over that, that not only did she leave me, but she left me knowing that I was going to be in a difficult situation, that I was going to suffer um, abuse and whatnot. And she knew that full well. And I even spoke on the phone with her once um, and told her about it. So, you know, that makes any kind of relationship between us poss impossible, I think. We're during their holiday season, and um, it can be a very hard time for a lot of people because I think this is the time of year where family and merriment and, you know, uh, when you look back on your childhood, what was Christmas like? Um, again, everything was so uh, crazy back then. There was, you know, there was really fun moments. Like, I remember once my dad had... Um, I had put something out for Santa Claus to see if he existed. And then I woke up and my dad had kind of uh, made these footprints all around my bed with temporary golden spray paint. And of course, then I woke up and I was terrified because it was like, Santa Claus has been all over the room. We have to laugh. <laughs> Are there any other uh, memories of Christmas that stick out the most? <laughs> Beyond Santa being in your room <laughs> while you sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but then there were other, it, it was sad because we were um, so down and out all the time. And once um, a social worker came by to see me on Christmas just to make sure I was actually getting any gifts that year. And she had brought me a toy poodle that had a little key mm -hmm. that you wind up and would play music. But then I wound it up and it didn't play any music at all. And it was just this broken poodle and it. It just made me cry and I, but I wasn't, I was just crying and I felt I was weeping for my entire situation in the whole world and it became this, and I couldn't stop crying. Mm -hmm. And now every Christmas, like I wake up even last year and I just wake up in the morning and I just start weeping with, um, I don't know what it is. It's like this disappointment or feeling of vulnerability and that everything is broken. Why do you think Christmas does that? Well, there's so much pressure. You see so many images of this kind of perfect family and families getting together and it's all very functional and like nuclear families and very middle class. And so inevitably, I, you compare your own situation to it and nobody kind of lives up to that hallmark image everybody everybody's family is a bit odd and you have everybody has losses and you know dealing with relatives who are a bit problematic or whatnot so just don't fit into that mold and I and I feel that the expectation of it just makes people feel so lonely and kind of inadequate you've said that the holidays make you feel little again in what ways mm -hmm. um it just bring when I wake up, it just brings me back because I think everybody associates uh, Christmas with childhood. And then so immediately I'm always back and I'm little again. And it's 
but it's even more devastating because at that, when I was first a child, mm -hmm. I didn't actually realize to what extent I was deprived of things or mistreated. And now when I look back and, and I'm in those, and sort of in that place again, it just breaks my heart mm -hmm. how lonely and vulnerable and how nobody kind of reached out to really take me out of that place or help me kind of navigate it. Um, the holidays also cause you grief. Why grief? Grief, I think, I think just grief for, for the loss of my mother, for the loss of, it's just a profound sadness of, um, having had to live through all those Christmases to get to where I am now. And I feel, um, I mean, when I did leave home and then I realized I didn't have to celebrate Christmas because it was such a wonderful, it was like this burden off my shoulder and I didn't have to be stuck with a, a family. I just got to be all by myself and do what I wanted and was in control of my life. So, but I just feel, I feel grief for the little me, I think. In a way, it's kind of like um, you're fed this uh, ideal of what life is supposed to be. And then when you don't have that ideal, it makes you feel less than, like there's something wrong with you. Oh yeah, of course, of course. It's always, it just seems that Christmas is so performative and people are always angry at each other and you have to do the perfect Christmas and then but presents. <laughs> nobody can nobody can live up to that that pressure. Yeah. You know, and it's also like I was saying, I kind of one of the reasons I've come through this all is because I've realized that even if you don't measure up to those images of bizarre middle class family life, you're still a wonderful person and you can still have your own rituals and celebrations and you know, even if you don't have a family or you're alone or, well, I don't know. You wrote on Twitter, um, I'm getting ahead of the game and canceling Christmas for myself. There should be a calendar for the abused where we have all new holidays that don't cause us to shudder with trauma. Uh, you know, we're all familiar with the hallmark narrative of the holidays, family, sitting around the fire, um, eating good food and um, uh, being together. Do you think that the narrative for the holiday should also include the fact that there's, it's also a very difficult time of the year for a lot of people. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, we should just realize that there are so many people waking up with this intense feeling of longing and regret and, um, absence. So many people have absences that, um, feelings, people that they're missing, and um, yeah, and it causes so much anxiety. It's hard to say why. It's almost, it's almost this manufactured emotion that um, we're all feeling. So I think somehow it should be incorporated into Christmas, um, this inclusivity of different feelings people are having. And it's not just happy holidays or joyous holidays. It's um, the profound holidays. We should just call it like the profound moment. We're all just feeling this... Um, deep feeling together and and there just needs to be more of a collective idea of what christmas is and not forgetting um other people and other families i mean it's called the most uh wonderful time of the year is it harder now um, um against the backdrop of the pandemic or does does that make any difference for me mm -hmm. or for every for you um I think, I think it's a little, I haven't even thought of it actually. I thought, um, maybe there's less pressure for people. We'll see what happens. I mean, it's, it's, we're all going to be forced to have these unusual Christmases this year. Mm -hmm. And even like, usually for Christmas, my daughter and I, we just go to Chinatown and see a movie. Cause I just refuse even like the smell of a pine tree in the house makes, uh, gives me such feelings of anxiety. Mm -hmm. So we're not even going to be able to do our ritual. Um, so yeah, it's going to be it's going to be an unusual Christmas this year. But one of the perhaps is interesting because we're all suffering the exact same 
um, situation. Um, before we run out of time, I want to get into some of the lessons that you write about, um, that you your dad taught you. And um, I, the, the book is called Wisdom and Nonsense. Why nonsense? Because they seem like such ridiculous um, ideas, all the lessons my dad would teach me. But within them, I've kind of, I really use them uh, to kind of become somebody interesting in the world and navigate. So lesson number one was your father told you to never keep a diary. Why? Oh, uh, that was funny because um, I got an uh, empty journal one year for my birthday. And in it, I began just transcribing, you know, my day-to-day -day life and everything that was going on around us. And my dad always had his old criminal friends and his who were up to no good. And I would just record everything. And it was just like so wonderful to be able to turn life into words. And then when I was done, my dad would just be like, he would just burn my diaries or throw them out. And he was like, you've got to stop this. They were, they're going to be used against us all in court. So, um, but you get yeah. a sense too that um, it was kind of like you were keeping a reckoning of him. Totally, yeah. It was in, in an unflattering way, and then all the because something unusual would happen, and then I'd just go immediately and write it down. And right. it's like, stop taking notes on our entire life. <laughs> Another lesson was uh, you should learn to play the tuba. What was the thinking behind that? Um. Well, my dad thought there was always, uh, I mean, he had no idea how one went out in the world and actually made some money. So he had this idea when I was a kid that there weren't enough tuba players. Mm -hmm. So when I got to high school, if I could be allowed to play the tuba, then I would never be unemployed because there would always be work for tuba players because they were so, um, there's always a shortage of them. <laughs> Okay, well, I have to get, I have to, we're running out of time, and I want to get into a few more of these. Another lesson was, accept that you're ugly and move on. Um, and I want to read a quote from that. You write, my father said that when I was a baby, I was so ugly that he was afraid to look at me. He would close his eyes and say, no, she can't be that ugly. But then when he opened them, there I was, even uglier than he remembered. As a child, he told me he was afraid a wind would pick me up and carry me away because my ears were so lar large. He called me chicken legs as an affectionate nickname because he said I was so skinny. I grew up thinking I was but ugly. I mean, this is just horrible stuff. Um, <laughs> what were the lessons there? Um, yeah, it's a, I mean, I, I don't think anybody's ugly. Like whenever I hear that word, somebody being described as ugly, I like I hate it. I, I just say no, no woman is ugly. There's, I just find um, we. I mean, I love the sparkle in people's eyes and when they have intelligence or something to say. And I think yeah, just having this idea that I was ugly kind of it turned around for me and I really realized that beauty's on the inside. And I became very. Um, just so frustrated by that word and the idea that we judge each other by physical appearance. And especially as women and young women, we just have this idea that we're in the male gaze and our value is in our appearance. And for me, that was always, um, I mean, I thought I was ugly. So I just was like, well, what can you do? I have to have to develop intellectual skills and whatnot and other ways to um, prove my, my self worth. But I feel everybody kind of needs to do that. And, and yeah, like I said, it's just, we're all so beautiful, I find. I just find people beautiful. I mean, the fact that as a child that didn't break you is incredible. Another lesson that you write about that he taught you is to never watch Paul Newman movies. Why? Oh, my dad was obsessed with Paul Newman because he was the same age as Paul Newman. And my dad had been very attractive when he was young. And that was one of the things he was, he was a very vain man. so. He didn't understand why Paul Newman had got this acclaim in the world and he hadn't and he would just kind of um, criticize Paul Newman's acting and say I could never watch it because Paul, um, Paul Newman had what he needed to have and somehow had stolen it from him. Um, you, in this book you write affectionately about your father and the lessons that he taught you, yet your father was abusive. How do you reconcile those two things? Um, like I said, it's very difficult and I don't, and I go through periods where, um, 
some periods are, are lighter and then, um, yeah, especially, I think that's one of the reasons I use these lessons in life. And I talk about these things because it makes it easier to kind of focus on the good things. And then there are moments when just the reality of it and comes and hits me in a harder way. So, and you never kind of know what phase you're going to go through. Oftentimes, oddly, it depends on right on what I'm writing because writing actually helps me um, deal with like bring the good stuff up. So I and I and I kind of try and hold on to that, even though um, you know there's there's just the reality that there are very hard moments and that I suffered a lot through. Heather, thank you so much for sharing um, so much of yourself with us. We really appreciate it. And uh, because it is the pandemic, hopefully an opportunity for all of us to create new traditions. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Oh, thank you for having me. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.